e te ti e te ta. E aku rakatera koto ka manuhiri ki tene wahi o te rua hikiki. Iraro te maro o aoraki. A koto ka to tena koto. A tena koto hei mihi atu. Ki a koe hoke e marama. Kei te whakapupune a hau. A ku tūtārika mō tō kōrero. O te ata nei. Hei mihi whakamihara ki a koe. Hei mihi uru hau no hoki. It is many years since I've heard a New Zealand politician of any ilk use language like the colonial project. My heart rose, <laughs> my spirit flew, and I just pray that before the inevitable parliamentary anaesthesia sets in, <laughs> you will uh, be able to give more vent to such, uh, such thoughts. Uh, he mihi atu. Ki a koe hoke e kere ama. Uh, Nga roa te kā, kākuhu o te. Nga pai. A koutou kato. No tēnā, no tēnā, no tēnā. A tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā rātata. Well, um, kia ora koutou kato e tautuku anau. Ka mihi a, a taku pāpa. Um, Julian's actually read the first three uh, paragraphs of our, um, of our speech here. So, um, but I'll do it all again just to hear him use the kaitahu dialect. <laughs> kia ora, kia ora. Ka pai. Nā reira, for today's kōrero we will focus on these two aho or strands of education and learning. The first being that which is concerned with the development of specific skill sets, more often than not linked to specific employment positions or roles. And the second strand being the broader pursuit of applica an application of educational knowledge that is concerned with the development of the whole thinking process, an extension of mind and thought. The broad theme that was given to us to help frame our corridor was the repositioning of Māori education within our tertiary institutions in order to advance iwi aspirations. That's very laudable. <laughs> and naturally, it's like motherhood and apple pie, I'm in favour of it. The script fathers. We have opened, I think, we have opened by identifying what our aspirations are for our people, what we aspire to and the dangers we see inherently within the current practice. However, not suggesting by any means that these are indeed shared by our people necessarily. Of course it would be arrogant to assume such a position and that would be contrary to the O'Regan disposition. <laughs> uh, and while Hannah wrote that, uh, I would uh, point out that it's a subject on which I uh, feel quite untroubled by self-doubt. Okay. Um... <laughs> Instead, what we aim to do with you today is to look at these questions and attempt to weave together these two strands of educational aspiration within the context of the modern tertiary environment and propose, from our perspective, that a potential focus for iwi that might serve as a kākahu for the collective aspiration is the combination of these two aho. We're of the view that, by and large, we're doing OK with strand one, the production of skilled workers trained in the content knowledge of their required field. Nurses with the skills needed to nurse, carpenters with the skills needed to build, chefs with, well, you get the picture, but <laughs> our programme and qualification requirements in the tertiary sector have become increasingly prescriptive in terms of needing to identify the, quote, employment pathway for the qualification. And there's a growing expectation of tertiary providers to ensure they produce work-ready graduates and then support their graduates into meaningful employment outcomes <laughs> aligned to their qualifications. The government's tertiary strat education strategy clearly states that the expectations around student transitions and graduate outcomes are going to increase 
and that institutions will continue to be measured closely on their outcomes across all priority learner groups, Māori, Pacifica and youth, and for all students to ensure the educational investment in achieving the desired outcome. This focus has resulted in a stripping away of elements of education where the knowledge or skill in a given course or programme is not easily mapped to a specific career or profession. <coughs> we are starting the conversation of career planning earlier and earlier, supporting developed discussions about subject choice and potential careers in primary school and intermediate. We have adopted and mapped our provision in the secondary tertiary arena to vocational pathways. A huge amount of work has gone on in this area over the last decade, and we have seen pioneering initiatives achieve incredible results. There is a danger, though, that what we might produce will be well-trained people of stunned imagination. Stunted. <laughs> and stunned imagination. Better than stoned. <laughs> can read or obviously can't, <laughs> people who can read and interpret manuals but who don't read for pleasure, indeed who are non-literate, we will return to this theme shortly. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for the level of accountability that institutions now have to respond to. I think it's absolutely appropriate that we be accountable for the advice we give to students and for the programmes we develop, needing to deliver on what it is we say they will achieve and get out of their qualification. In the current environment where students have a limited number of F lives or years where they are eligible for loans and allowances and subsidised study, the cost of getting it wrong for the student or not having meaningful pathways to employment after their study is too great. We simply can't afford to have students undertake years of secondary schooling <coughs> that doesn't provide them with access to their preferred tertiary options and then years of tertiary study that leaves them on the unemployed benches of society. The problem on our view is in the area of what is deemed to be unnecessary, unnecessary knowledge and learning, of what is stripped away, and the inability of many people to be able to translate a wider range of knowledge and understanding to the desired skills that are of value to any employer and actually a value to our society as a whole. There's real danger in only measuring the outcomes by employment. To do so is to ignore that that same person is a child, a family member, a future or current mother or father, a member of the community, who needs to understand a variety of skills to best contribute to that wider society beyond the workplace. And that those contributions are what also add value to their employment. Their ability to create, to think, to connect to others, to understand culture and transmission of knowledge, to inspire those around them, to be inspired, those things matter. Those are the skills and characteristics that need to be nurtured along our educational pathways and through our educational programs. These are the marks of educated people. This is what we have been stripping away. To simply neglect these elements of education is to naively produce a population that has limited depth in certain areas. But the pool of understanding and potential housed within it is shallow. What's more, when we only ever have the expectation, expectation of doggy paddling, we, are very quickly, we very quickly find ourselves in over our heads when we are required to swim, perhaps a pun gone too far. Yeah, typical. When, when the situation changes, when the economy shifts, when new technologies mean that those careers no longer exist and are superfluous to requirements, what then? If your skills and foundations of knowledge are not transferable across different pools and you are not trained in the art of adapting or repositioning those skills, as the tides change and shift us from the known world into the unknown, then we will become the washed up driftwood of another generation. Lovely metaphor. Kia ora. So we agree with the need to provision that to provision and support specialisation, the nurturing and development of tohoka in all areas, from architecture to creative literature, engineering to microbiology and computer programming. What we propose that the full potential and benefit of those tohoka 
and their sustainability will never be fully realised if the foundations upon which their expertise is built is myopic in its prescription and its application. If we are to reposition our educational institutions to help achieve iwi aspirations, we could best learn from the examples left to us by our tūpuna, as Marama referred to before, and their own approaches. The dominating characteristic of Polynesian culture and Māori culture history in South Polynesia was, historically, an extraordinary capacity for dynamic adaptation. We maintain that it is this characteristic that we should cleave to. To illustrate this point, the story of moving a culture from a world without seasons to a world dominated by seasons forced a shift to a whole new technology of food preservation and storage which reshaped the Polynesian culture that came here. This is a world which was abundant in food for three months of the year and without it for nine months of the year. This was a whole new experience Yet we evolved a whole new variant of Polynesian culture to respond to the environment of Aotearoa New Zealand and to Waipainamu as well. Now, th this, um, in order to articulate this enormous culture change, they reshaped their myth, the application of their whakapapa, their cultural practice and customs to fit their expanding world view into, its new, and to, and into new contexts. They were totally concerned with reshaping their presence so that it might offer a better and more sustainable future. Their past was adjusted to suit. In the 19th century, culture contact drove a whole new variant of this dynamic. And despite enormous privation and loss of political and economic autonomy, the colonial project, Māori culture embraced and absorbed a whole new world of technical, linguistic and economic evolution. The most dramatic exemplar of this phase is the adoption and incorporation of literacy into Māori culture. And I point out that some of the leading intellects of that process came from Papawai, came from Wairarapa, and from that whole history of Mātorahanga and that whole tradition within southern Kahanunu, of course, benefiting greatly from their branch being a branch of Naitahu Whakapapa. <laughs> and just to prove to my father that I do have the ability to read, I had the privilege of coming face to face with some of what that passion and hunger for literacy produced in the form of the 19th century Māori newspapers. One of my first jobs when I was a young university graduate at the age of 20 was in the bowels of the Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington, trolling through the screeds of microfiche copies of these old newspapers, looking for examples of Māori text that might be appropriate to bring together to make the publications to support the newly established immersion schools. I must have been much younger than that. Okay. Thousands upon thousands of newspapers with contributions from all around the country, all in Māori and later in both languages, and covering a breadth of kaupapa that talked of a people undeniably captivated with the issues of the wider world, as well as their own histories, relationships and politics. At times I was dumbfounded, wondering why they were considering some of the more boring topics worthy of comment. Animal husbandry, <laughs> the imagery of which I could never expel from my mind once I figured out what they were talking about. <laughs> Right next to comparisons of English and Māori poets, religious debates, wars in Africa and Russia, the price of wool in Europe, they just seemed to be interested in everything and were eager to present their views, put them up for debate, challenge the views of others. It was all on. This thirst for knowledge and interest in learning about the outside world was an enduring characteristic within pockets of our society for some time. It's a characteristic of a number of komatua that many of you here will remember. Unfortunately, as we as a people started uh, living up to the negative expectations of our New Zealand political and educational system, the pool was becoming increasingly smaller. 
One of the most impressive characteristics that some of the distinguished komatua that I personally had association with, from Peter Hurani Jones, Te Rangi Pokeha, John Rangiho, Māori Marsden, Rangi Wawahia Solomon, has been the, was the, the great impression I had was the generality of their interest, the breadth of their inquiry, the breadth of their capacities. In the case of Peter Hurani, for example, uh, there he is, uh, the, the two on the left, two pictures on the le your left. Um, he was a man who was able to compare Māori traditional stories and forms together with their motifs and literary devices with Shakespeare and Goethe. This man translated both into Māori. I can recall trying to extract the Tati Honui Komatua Tarangi Pokiha from a seminar on natural sciences at Massey University. He was totally fascinated. I wanted to get home. <laughs> he was totally fascinated because the old man was seeing the relevance of the subjects, not just his own beloved Whanganui River, but a basis of comparison with his own mother's Waitotara River. He discovered that afternoon a fresh way of understanding the two most precious tawaka in his world. And he was captivated by the Natural Sciences Lab in a university. Now, it's not just Pākehā stuff. These old people had this amazing hunger for a breadth of knowledge. And of the great Kaumātua that I have known, the one characteristic that they all shared was that inquiring, breadth of inquiring mind. And that's what we're short of. The evidence of a culture founded on appreciation of critical thinking, debate and search for knowledge is in every aspect of our traditional histories. From the journeys of Maui, Tafaki and Tane to our own Auraki and Tuteraki Whanua, to the protocols and rituals of engagement that house our cultural practices. Even in the process of a pōhiri, and its re respective parts, they lay down a platform of critical thinking and discussion. The kaikaraka will introduce the issues to be addressed or debated. The reasons for doing so, these will then be taken up and systematically addressed in the context of the fai kōrero. <coughs> the kōpapurotara, or the take issue, will be laid down with the expectation of responses or new angles to be presented and critiqued. Of course, we've seen this area fade into the realms of the very ordinary over the years on some marae as well. The depth and breadth of kaupapa too is stripped away, leaving only the bones of the ritual in place, simply to achieve the function of bringing the groups together, instead of inspiring new thoughts and intellectual engagement. He knew why did. The same can be said about the use of our reo itself. Over time, we have moved from a language rich in emotion and depth to a process of standardisation and simplification. I'm not speaking here of the losses incurred with the move away from our dialects, although, as you know, that's an issue close to my heart. I'm talking about the moaning of the masses when our broadcasters such as Julian Wilcox or our speakers extend our language knowledge by using a wider range of words to describe a point. Instead of praises of gratitude for doing so, they are often ridiculed for their fancy language that no one can understand. <coughs> the Scotty Morrisons, the Timothy Karatus, or the Māori Language Commission of our Te Reo world are regularly challenged with the complexity of their language. People articulate their disdain at this display of arrogance that someone might dare to use the full breadth of language and its intrinsic beauty when presenting our news. Has it really come to that? That we are threatened to be in a position that we don't know a word or phrase and that somehow that makes the other person deficient? Our language is characterised by an extraordinary efflorescence of metaphor. Metaphor cannot exist without comparison. Metaphor demands a generality of knowledge to make it work. Why do we constantly request for things to be simplified? I have this problem speaking in English to Tarunang or Naito. <laughs> Script. <laughs> this is not just an issue for Te Reo Māori. 
I'm not even going to list the words that flowed from my father's lips when preparing this presentation that I had to search the meanings of. And I won't even touch on my spelling, and hopefully neither will he, that, ended, uh, that needed editing. His use of English, his passion for words. Although native Māori language speakers will often say they are native speakers and can't understand that, Mr Morrison or Mr Wilcox, I can't use that argument on my father as I am a native speaker of English. But it doesn't mean that I understand all he speaks. I myself follow the 80-10-10 rule. I aim for 80% comprehension. 10% of the words or meanings I don't know, I will pretend to him that I do know and secretly write them down for later reference checking. And the other 10% I feel safe enough to ask about. If only 10% I'm relieved. <laughs> A minimum 80% it would be quite nice really. But. The expansion of the Māori intellect into a written form also occurred with the exposure of Māori culture to a whole range of other cultures. And in the 19th century, the old people just didn't refer to those people as Pākehā or their knowledge as Pākehā knowledge. They re referred to them as different. At Upper Lima, they understood the distinction between Pākehā and Hainamana, between Ingarehe and Ngatiwiwi, and even between Airehi and Kotimana. The old man that I knew and I referred to, many of them had been at Teote, had been hugely impressed by the Greeks, and particularly the writings of Cicero. One night I listened to Peter Hurunui Jones talk passionately, but informally, about Cicero's great work, Rhetoric. And he was talking about Winston Churchill's use of the tricolon, blood, sweat and tears. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto kato. And then comparing this to the Māori application which I've just used, haere mai, haere mai, haere mai, using the tricolon by repetition. And old Pei was getting off on the way that Churchill used this much more imaginatively than we did. <laughs> but the third breath would always have a different uh, twist to it in his case. And so he then ran on with a further argument that in Māori, uh, Māori rhetoric, quite often there was a reliance on two, and he disagreed with Cicero to some degree. And there was a, a vigorous debate about the merits of Cicero uh, between these Pei and his colleagues. Uh, Tufangai was the other one, and he was nodding vigorously. I'm not sure he really followed it all, but uh, Pei was really into the question of how many elements, was the tricolon the only trick of rhetoric or was there a, uh, 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 a no, Jew no, colon? And he quoted, ititi etita, iaku iti iaku rahi. Barack Obama, who's the current world expert on this subject, um, uh, was still to come. My whole point is that these old komato I referred to had absorbed Cicero's thinking about rhetoric and they'd absorbed it in their own terms, into their own terms of reference. They knew enough about both to have the debate. Most of us don't know enough about either. So these stories and recollections paint a picture of our people as thinkers, as innovators, where knowledge for knowledge's sake was valued and indeed seen as a necessity, where our worldview, our traditions and customs all contributed to reinforcing those values and collective aspirations. So let us ask ourselves the question, how do we get there again? When we are constantly being asked to deliver educational pathways with clearly defined boundaries and outcomes, how do we create thinkers? How do you foster an inquiring mind and can it actually be done in our tertiary world, in our institutions and by our teachers? How do you create that depth of understanding? The first requirement is a desire to move and explore beyond the obvious, beyond the known, and an appreciation of the value of that expanded knowledge base. My father often quotes the late Tuhoi elder John Dangiho when he said, there's no point speaking Māori unless you have something Māori to say. <laughs> if I return to my father's knowledge of language and learning, he tells of a time tricking the Wellington Hills at the feet of his father with his reference book and books in hand. Not so much to hand, I had to carry them. There were always three books. 
always three books, Cotton's Geomorphology of New Zealand, Lang and Blackwell's uh, Natural Native Plants of New Zealand, and there was a Reed's book on Maori proverbs and place names. Dreadful book, I would say in retrospect, but it was, it was always the three. Waterproof covers. We'd climb to the top of some damn hill. I'd get to the top of it and the old man would stand up there and glare out over the horizon, look at the shape, say, boy, how do you think that, that valley there, that gully was formed? The last thing I wanted to know, I'd lie there, absolutely puffed out and exhausted. I, I don't know, Dad. Look it up, sir, look it up. And I'd have to get the book out of my backpack, sit out there on the top of some darn hill in the southeasterly and look it up. Over time, I learned a habit. And I don't know whether you actually want to have children at 11 years old read encyclopedias for fun. <laughs> but if you do, that's the way you get them. Now, my father didn't apply the same model to raising me. And in his defense, I wasn't a reader, no matter how much he wanted me to be so. And I will say this before he does, that I, yes, I do like waiting for the movie to come out. Um, reading for me is a chore, and the only consolation for my father is that the older four siblings didn't disappoint him in this respect. The point here isn't about my failure, to, it's not about my failure to digest the, literature, the, um, digest the literature of the world, but that I was able, still able to foster and have fostered a love for language and learning beyond literature. I was still encouraged to inquire and debate and use the skills I had at my disposable, at my disposal, <laughs> which included a love for creative language to extend my mind and understanding of knowledge. It's all right, I forgive you. <laughs> I've been forced in later life to include contemporary poetry in my catalogue of improved items. Okay, so whilst I don't purport for one moment to have the range either in language or content that my father has, I do like and get excited about knowledge and learning. In my university days, I saw the benefits of this expansive knowledge firsthand. This one would be asked to come up to the university to give a lecture, and I'd be summoned then to show him to the right room. One week it would be zoology, the next accounting, the next classics or political history, or Māori studies. Sometimes, as only an arrogant child, the youngest of five could do, I'd challenge him and say, what do you know about zoology, Dad? You know these guys are going to be expecting to hear from an expert. Stay and listen, he'd say. So I would, half expecting to ha have to save him somehow from the unruly, ungrateful zoology university students. And I would sit there time after time and have to eat my words. Humility, of course, is something that I've um, become accustomed to. As my father would dive passionately, that's enough, as my father would dive passionately into the depths of the subject of the day and excite the audience with his ability to locate the Māori world within the subject at hand and draw on the vast examples to do so. If you're going to have something Māori to talk about, you can also appreciate the richness that can come to that understanding by having the capacity to compare that knowledge to other knowledge. The foundation of the Enlightenment period, which spawned the whole expansion of what was called useful knowledge, foundation of the Royal Society, those sorts of organisations in the wider world, not just in the West, but also in Russia and China, that expansion of intellectual horizons spawned Benjamin Franklin and the philosophy of useful knowledge, Joseph Banks and ultimately Captain Cook, Robert Fitzroy and all the other hydrographers. Their scientific exploration of the world was ultimately to be founded on the taxonomy developed by Linnaeus of Sweden. Now, whilst the Westerners were incapable of seeing Māori beliefs about the natural world as science, because science was theirs. Natives, by definition, could not have science. Māori were quite happy, they were quite, um, the Westerners. They were quite, these Westerners were quite happy to have their own understanding of the natural world organised and founded on Linnaean tax, uh, taxonomy. Māori, however, Encountering these scientists quickly realised that the Māori equivalent of the useful knowledge thesis was alive and well within Māori intellectual tradition, and that they had their own complex and sophisticated taxonomy of the natural world, 
of Aotearoa built around a grand motif of whakapapa, and Motoranga would be the perfect example of that realisation with its whole monotheistic approach. Now, both Western and Māori systems were both, first of all, systematic. That's the primary requirement of scientific analysis. But you can only luxuriate in the appreciation of Māori cultural systems and fully understand its power if you can compare it with the evolution of Western scientific systems and enjoy the in interaction of one on the other. Understand how Fitzroy founded the science of meteorology was by going to ordinary rural illiterate people and talking to them. The, the science, were they scientific? Of course they were. Science is ultimately based on the empirical. Māori history, Māori understandings of structure of the natural world are based on empirical experience. It's not, you might articulate it through a taxonomy of myth and so on and whakapapa, but you've arrived at your understanding of it from empirical experiment. If we're to view this from another angle, without having the understanding of Māori taxonomy, then we, in our mātauraka, our, educa our traditional education knowledge base, are susceptible to that knowledge being neglected and overrun by the introduction of a new system of thought, without any debate, application or, an anal or analysis. Māori knowledge becomes what Te to has called false knowledge. Uh, you'll be astonished to know that I take a contrary view to Te Māori. <laughs> What I believe, and I'm in the happy situation, he's in Montana and not here to defend himself. <laughs> what I believe is that our 19th century tūpuna did was to integrate and adapt the new knowledge they were encountering into their own knowledge system, just as they took carving to new levels by adopting steel chisels and converting their ponamu chisels into tiki. Take the Potini myth about the origins and creation of Ponamu. It starts with Tuhua and, and Mata, the volcanic glass, Mare Island, and Whanga Mata. Mata. The, this whole Potini myth is essentially from up there in the Bay of Plenty right through to, to Tai Potini, is essentially New Zealand's first geological survey map. It's a systematic description of stones and so on. It tells you what they knew about stones. I talked about empirical experiment. One of the stones they come past is the Paho flints at Barrytown. Of all the New Zealand flints, it's the only flint that will drill Ponema. How did they find it? How long did it take it to find it? What empirical experiment went into developing that drill? having to find a tip for the drill is an interesting starter. Now, my point is, this whole Potini myth and that whole experience tells us about the virtues of volcanic glass, the obsidian, right? Now, they knew what, what, what uh, Tuhua could do. They knew where to find it. They knew all sorts of things about it. They created all a whole structure to go with it, but they didn't know that it came from volcanoes. What they did was they then, in the 19th century, they melded that new emergent geological understanding, which Westerners were only just getting. And they took that state-of-the-art knowledge and blended it into their own structure and understanding. And that is a characteristic of this dynamic adaptation. That's what we've, the frame we've got to look at, Māori thinking, continuing to evolve in. So where to from here? For those of us who, have who are engaged in the provision of education in the tertiary sector, we have the very real challenge of shifting a generation who has become very used to the instant gratification achieved through the immediate access of knowledge, through Google or Wikipedia and being seemingly content with, that, with, the search, with whatever the search button uh, finds. Not one thing often to take it the extra step to inquire about its origin or the validity of information we have at hand. 
We're more likely to choose the easy route and are happy to have an emotional response to the information, even though we may still be largely uninformed. We need to somehow inspire our students and our community to get excited again by the words they didn't know, the pieces of transformational knowledge that can help create new connections and understanding. We need to weave this thread into all that we do so that it becomes intertwined and is one with the thread comprised of the core knowledge and skills required for successful careers. We can't allow ourselves to be captured by the singular focus of acquisition of an applied school for employment. We need to embed in all we teach the satisfaction of knowing, the joy of knowing, the delights of interacting with the inquiring mind. And we need to find ways in which those delights are shared with our wider whānau and community, not just relegated to the halls of academia. The great set of questions confronting a re-emergent Māori culture is how it sees itself in a context of national and world cultures, how it wishes to stand in that company. If it wishes merely to be a subset of the transplanted Western culture that passes for New Zealand in the 21st century, then all it needs to do is imitate the status quo and decorate it with a bit more performance and will no doubt have a flourishing waka toy. If, however, it wants to take full command of itself as a fully paid up subscribing partner in the New Zealand experiment, it must first confidently articulate itself on its own terms, making no apology for its absorption of world culture with which it has transformed itself so far. It need not apologise for that absorption and adoption of other cultures through the 19th and 20th century, any more than Pākehā culture apologises for acquiring pen and paper from the Chinese, the cadmium battery from the Japanese, misspelled cadmium, Hannah, or the properties, of the properties of quinine from the Amazon. Quinine misspelled again too. <laughs> In fact, to not welcome that and recognise that quality, uh, and in fact advocate it, would be contrary to the principles of Mātauraka of our tūpuna. The whole Polynesian heritage, and particularly the Māori branch of it, which is founded on that principle of dynamic adaptation, that's our glory. For God's sake, don't apologise for it. Our tertiary education processes should be absolutely devoted to the development of broadly educated, wide-ranging intellects, which can cast a net with which to harvest all useful knowledge and give our culture a stronger base for a strong foundation for our tamariki to launch into the next round of dynamic adaptation. We already have the answer on how to re reposition our tertiary institutions to meet our Māori aspirations. We need to pay heed to our tūpuna's examples and approach, and their approach to the world with all the navigational and exploration, exploration prowess that they did. So if you don't yet know the answer, I can but reply and suggest to you that you look it up, sir. Make your point, girl. Tell me the alternatives. Spell out the options. Find them yourself. Go back to the derivation. What is the use of Latin? None whatsoever, thank God. Lord, preserve us from the tyranny of relevance. Thank you. Thank. <laughs> oh, and the last shot. Nā tipani o Regan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>